darkness has settled on the eastern part of the United States. John F. Kennedy, who departed the White House Thursday morning as President of the United States, has returned the victim of an assassin in Dallas, Texas. The man suspected of having committed this offense is under arrest. His name is Lee Oswald. He is now being investigated and interrogated by federal and state authorities in Texas. The new President of the United States, Lyndon Baines Johnson, has arrived with the First Lady at the White House. He will spend the night there. All of NBC's programs for the remainder of this evening and until further notice have been canceled in order that we might keep you completely and fully and immediately abreast of all the developments in this tragedy. Expressions of regret have been heard from around the world. Uh, they will not suffice. The President of the United States is dead. We have a new President. And uh, NBC's Chet Huntley and David Brinkley have prepared a special 90-minute program which we will bring you immediately following this break for station identification. Hunter and his quarry build an empathy between them, a sympathy. As the chase builds toward the inevitable conclusion, is it possible that subconsciously they become aware of each other's moves, counter moves, plans, even emotions? There are two individuals who will tell you that's so the poet and the cop. Our story begins after this word. At 19, Jill Kinmont was one of America's top women skiers till an accident on an icy slope left her paralyzed. Now, 17 years later, she's a teacher, a good teacher. I guess you can say I've overcome my handicap, but I couldn't have done it alone. I had family, friends, people who accepted me, believed in me, and helped me believe in myself. Yet there are millions of handicapped people in this country who aren't getting the acceptance they deserve because some people think that a handicapped person can't hold down a job, can't pay the rent, can't learn, can't be a human being. Well, unless you recognize that we are human beings with feelings, with skills, with a sense of responsibility, then you're adding a handicap we can't overcome. This public service message brought to you on behalf of the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare and the Advertising Council. Picture this, a windy, rainy November night in New York City. A man about 30, his most identifiable feature, a crest of flaming red hair, stands in a public telephone booth. Rohan? This is the Turner house. There's no one. Rohan? Did you say Rohan? Uh, uh. Hello? Who is this? The red haired man wears no raincoat. When he pulls up his jacket collar, we see a revolver stuck into his trousers. The red-haired man walks to the end of the street, where he turns and is lost to our view. His destination is East Vandu's Place, a small exclusive street near the river, where large apartments cost a lot of money. Inside one of them, a married couple, Albert and Mercedes Turner. Quiet. What? Oh, am I? I'm sorry. Would you care to tell me who called? It wasn't anyone. Well, I heard you asking questions. You told someone this was the Turner house. You said another name. What was it? I've forgotten. It wasn't anything. 
It couldn't have been. You lie badly. And you lie a great deal of the time. Don't, Albert. Please, don't bait me. The door? Yes. Hmm. Shall I? No. No, I'll get it. Hello, Mercy. You. It is you. Oh, you. You. I tried to warn you. I called, but then I lost my nerve. I froze. Oh, Mercy. Mercy. Mercedes? Who's at the door? Mercedes? Come in, Hugh. Who is it? it? It's someone who... Albert, it's someone who... It's all right, Mercy. It's all right. Well, if you're through kissing my wife, come in and let me get a look at you. Come in, darling. Come in. Well, introduce us, my dear. I'm Hugh Rohan. Am I supposed to know you? Mercy, didn't you tell Hugh's me? my... I thought he'd been killed in Vietnam. Rohan? Oh, of course, that's the name you said on the phone. The last time I saw Mercy, she was my wife. Your wife? Mercedes, is that so? Yes. I was Hugh's wife. Long ago. <laughs> did you just forget to tell me, my dear? Slip your mind in it? That you were already married when you jumped into my bed? Don't talk to her I like... I wasn't married. I'd obtained an Enoch Arden decree. You divorced me? Well, then, <laughs> at least you're not a bigamist. Whatever else you might be. Why, Mercy? Why did you Seven do it? Seven years, Hugh. They said you were missing in action, presumed dead. I waited seven years, darling. For a con. What? <laughs> you waited seven years for a convict. Missing in action? <laughs> Don't make me laugh. <laughs> Hugh, what does he mean? I mean he's a con. He has the stink of prison all over him. Haircut, prison issue, shoes... Unless he's anemic, he hasn't seen the sun all those seven missing in action years. What's he talking about, you? Put that phone down. Oh, my dear phony fellow, it's my duty as a public-spirited citizen to tell the police there's an escaped con in my living room. Put it down. If you come near me, I'll blow your head off. Put that gun away, Albert, please. Please, put the gun away. Operator. <laughs> Albert? He's dead. You shot him. He was going to call the police and spoil it. I waited seven years, Mercy. Seven years! So he's dead. What will happen to us? I, I don't remember if I'd ever seen a dead body before. But Hugh faced the matter as if it were almost commonplace. He hung up the phone, which had fallen to the floor, and then closed Albert's eyes. He would have separated us again. I couldn't let him do that. Was it true? What he said about you? No. We can't stay here. Then we'll leave. You take what you need, and we'll leave together. No. Not yet. What? I can't leave until tomorrow. We'll need money. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Uh, I'll stay with you until morning. No, you have to leave now while it's dark. Otherwise, someone might see you. What about him? We'll put him in his room. 
The maid comes at 10 o'clock. We don't want her to find him right away. All right. Where do you want him? His bedroom. I'd better answer it. It might be the operator. Maybe she traced his call. Where is, where is this bedroom? Through that door, the room on the, on the right. All right, if that's the operator, tell her everything's fine. We were playing a game and the phone fell off the table. Hello? Al? What? Al there? Albert? Did you want to talk to Albert? Let me talk to Al. Who is it? Is that the operator? Someone wants to speak to Albert. Not Albert, Al. What's the matter? Are you drunk? I want to talk to Alan. Alan Fox. My goodness, can't you understand a simple request? Alan Fox. That's it. You have a wrong number. There's no one here by that name. Oh, I'm most extremely sorry. I thought it was someone... I don't know, someone who heard us or saw us through a window. I was frightened. It's all right. Everything's all right now. We're together. Yes, We'll always be together because that's how it was meant to be. Go now, while it's dark. I'll get the money in the morning. Then come to the rooming house where I'm staying. Here's the address. I wrote it down so I wouldn't forget. All right. In the morning. Good night. Good night. Some gifts don't do anything. But Presto Gifts do almost everything. Presto Gifts, they do things for a woman. Give her the famous Presto Pressure Cooker. It'll cook a surprising number of things for her surprisingly fast. Three times faster than pots and pans. Presto Gifts, they do things for a woman. Give her Presto's Jumbo Fry Pan. Big enough for a complete dinner for eight. And the handles are removable, so it's easy to clean and store. Presto gift. They do things for a woman. Give her an easier way to broil. The brand new Presto Vertical Broiler broils both sides at once, then comes apart for easy cleaning. This year, give the gifts that do almost everything. Give Presto gifts. Presto gifts. We'll return to our story in a moment. Where does today's girl learn to be tomorrow's woman? At the movies? On television? Helen, darling, your floors are so shiny. Yes, John. I used Brand X polish just this morning. Brand X. Helen, will you marry me? Between the super sex symbol of today's commercialism and TV's Brand X image, impending womanhood is alive and well. And where is that somewhere? Wherever there are campfire girls. Campfire reaches the girl reaching out for tomorrow and puts a promise before her. The promise of personal development, of friends and fun. The promise of womanhood. Campfire takes today's girl to tomorrow. My name is Williams, Detective 19th Precinct. Not every detective working on a murder in New York City belongs to the Homicide Squad. The detective from the precinct where the killing occurs is also assigned to it. East Vanda's place is in the 19th, and therefore the report of Albert Turner's death came over our desk, and I went out on it. The medical examiner and the technical services crew were already there when I arrived. Williams, over here. Hey, you precinct guys sleep in or what? It's almost noon. Only got it half hour ago. When did homicide here? Half hour ago. I just got there. Hmm. Well, this is quite some beautiful layout. Yeah, it's class. Real dope. Who reported it? The maid, Thelma Jordan. She found the body. Uh, Miss Jordan? 
Turner's her boss. She'll tell you about it. Yes, Mr. Scores. This is Detective Williams here, Miss Jordan, 19th Precinct. He'll be working with me on this. Hello. Uh, tell me where you found Mr. Turner. Well, the poor man was in his bedroom. I thought he was asleep, lying in bed, covers all drawn up. He live here alone? Oh, no, sir. They are married. Is it Mrs. Turner? Oh, yes, indeed. Well, where is she? Well, I'm sure I don't know. She wasn't here this morning when I came in. She at work? Oh, no, sir. She don't work. Well, isn't Mr. Turner usually up and around? Oh, yes, sir, but this morning Miss Turner left me a note. Here. Let me see that. Thelma, Mr. Turner wasn't well last night. Don't awaken him. He needs the rest. <laughs> Mercedes Turner. Dr. Branch from the medical examiner's office. He's with the body. What do you suppose happened to Mrs. Turner? I can't even guess. Very well. All right. What happened? One shot straight in the ticker. Fully clothed. Suit, shoes, lying under covers. Tell me, doctor, did you close the eyes? No, but somebody did. Who? His wife? Remind me to ask her when we find her. Also, how come she didn't notice a dead husband in the bedroom? This is a man's room. Apparently, they had separate bedrooms. How long has he been dead? Yeah, it's a guess. I'd say since around midnight. Another guess for you, Doc. Possible suicide? Yeah, uh, negative. No powder stains in the front of his shirt. There's at least none I can find without a microscope. Besides, when There's I... There's no gun. That's right. There is one. We haven't found it yet. Uh, another thing, you'll notice that not much bleeding. Probably shot someplace else, then placed in the bed. Any idea where? Uh, possibly. The technical boys found something in the living room. Oh? What? Possible blood stain on the rug. They clipped the sample and they're going to check it. Mm. Near the bar by the phone. Yeah. Shot as he was calling someone? Maybe. You know, when I got here, this chair had been pulled up to cover that stain. The boys nearly missed it. Yeah. Oh, uh, Miss Jordan? Yes? Uh, listen, does Miss Turner have a book where she keeps phone numbers, you know, uh, stores, shops, beauty parlor, places where she might be this morning? Yeah, I'll get it. A and would you uh, check her things for us, see if anything's missing? Yeah, right, right away. Where do you suppose she is, Will? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Can't even guess. Think maybe something's happened to her? It's possible, Scores. It's very possible. Judy, do you remember what I told you about all that high-speed turnpike driving you're doing now and all that power equipment on your new car? Yes, Caleb? About how they can make your engine so hot that the oil thins down so it may not protect your engine? Yes, Caleb. Now, how do you tell if your oil's too hot? Just watch the temperature gauge. Nope. That just shows how hot the radiator fluid is. Oh, I know. When the oil's too hot, that little red light goes on. Nope. That just tells you the oil pressure's too low. Well, how do I tell if my oil's too hot? Fact is, you can't. Then how do I know my engine's protected? Make sure you're using quality oil, like Quaker State. Quaker State's specially made to stand up to high engine heat so it can keep right on protecting like an oil's supposed to. Is that the reason you always recommend Quaker State? That's one reason. Quaker State, your car, to keep it running young. The Zero Hour continues after this. This land is your land. America, the greatest nation on earth. But as our country continues to grow, it must face the problems of expansion, such as the now ominous shortages of fuel and energy. There are ways you can help conserve these vital resources. Reduce thermostat settings by two or three degrees. Shut off lights and heat in rooms not in use. And reduce the consumption of electricity in late afternoon or evening. Remember, in conserving fuel and energy, you help yourself and your community. Public Service message is presented by the President's Office of Emergency Preparedness and the Office of Consumer Affairs. It has 
happened so suddenly, all of it. Hugh returned from the dead, holding me in his arms. Suddenly we were young again and innocent. Then Albert began saying those terrible, threatening things. Of course Hugh had shot him. If I'd had a gun, I would have too. Hugh killed him for me, really. Now we had to get away. I couldn't sleep that night, alone in the apartment with Albert's body. In the morning, I gathered some clothes, including my fur coat, left a note for Thelma Jordan, the maid, and hurried to the bank. Mrs. Turner, good morning. How nice to see you. Good morning, Mr. Forrest. How may we serve you? Is Mr. Turner feeling well? Oh, yes, thank you. Would you cash this check for me? Yes, certainly. $4,500. Are you closing your account? Oh, I wouldn't dream of it. No. If you promise you won't tell Albert. Not a word. Well, I'm being terribly extravagant. I simply can't resist a lovely new car, and I promise to pay the difference in cash. <laughs> and surprise Albert. Exactly. Of course. Oh, and uh, while you're getting the cash, I promised Albert I'd bring him some papers he left in our safe deposit box. The money will be here when you get back. Thanks so much. where it is. Here, here, let me have your coat. Where have you been? I, I, I thought, I thought it's too good to be true. She's gone to the police. She's told them what happened. No, no, darling. I withdrew money from the bank and took my jewelry from the safe deposit Doesn't box. matter, doesn't matter. You're here. That's all that's important. Seven years, Mercy. I waited seven years to be with you. Seven empty years. I, I just don't seem to be able to function without you. You. What did Albert mean when he called you a convict? Oh, nothing. Forget it. Come on, come here. Come here with me. Here, here, sit down. Was it terrible? All those years? I told you, I'm not complete without you. Mercy. We can't stay here, darling. The police will be looking for us. I know. You? Yeah. I felt the same way. Incomplete. All the while you were gone. You're all I I've ever really had, my darling. You're everything that makes me warm and soft. Oh, you. There's certain procedures you set in motion after a homicide. You look for the deceased's enemies. You question everyone who might know something about what happened at the time of the crime. You make sure the lab is checking fingerprints and possible blood stains, lost bits of hair, anything and everything. In my job, you're trying to solve a puzzle. When you first begin, there's nothing there. Yes, sir, I, I certainly will. Hey, who was that? The commissioner. Want to know what we have. They're asking questions upstate, you know. Well, tell me, Will. What has the 19th been able to come up with in how long? Six hours since we got the call? Well, we have a dead man and a missing wife. I called the phone numbers and made found for me, beauty parlor and such. No one's seen her for the last day or so. The lab's pretty sure Turner was shot in the living room. They think that blood stain near the phone will match his type. That's great. Turner's shot in the living room near the phone. 
With a bullet in his heart, he walks into the bedroom and gets settled down under the covers, which is where he expires. Which leaves us at square one. Someone shot Turner in the living room, carried him to the bedroom, shut his eyes, then left the premises for who knows where. That, uh, that someone being Mrs. Turner, huh? That's all we have at the moment. Well, maybe we got a little more, Will. What do you mean? According to the maid, Mrs. Turner's overnight bag is missing, along with a few dresses, shoes and things, mm -hmm. and a fur coat, some bracelets, earrings, etc. Mm -hmm. All right. We'll find the lady. Uh, Mrs. Mercedes Turner. Last seen when? Uh, last night? Yeah, as far as we know. Carrying an overnight bag. Wearing a fur coat. and see. Uh, height. Uh, uh, you got a picture of her? From the apartment, you mean? Yeah, from the apartment. Every dummy in the world has snapshots. Weddings, picnics, holidays, trips, whatever. Not this lady. What? We tore that place apart. Well, there is no picture of her. We're putting out on all points for Mercedes Turner, and we don't have the faintest idea what she looks like. You are listening to Mutual's presentation of The Zero Hour. Even if someone served them a slice of beef, they couldn't bite into it. Their teeth are too weak. I'm not talking about some people over in Africa or Asia. I'm talking about Americans. American children. It's tragic how many thousands of them are in this country whose teeth will literally rot in their mouths because they'll never receive basic dental care. They may not even own a toothbrush. What hurts is that it takes so very little for any one of us to help them. The same dollar, for instance, that buys you two packs of cigarettes can buy three American children the first toothbrushes they've ever owned. I'm Cliff Robertson. Won't you give up some cigarettes so some American children can have their first toothbrush? Send your dollar to Americans for Children's Relief, Box 5050, Stamford, Connecticut. Box 5050, Stamford, Connecticut. One dollar. And, of course, if you can afford more, give more. This land is your land. This land is my land. greatest nation on earth. But as our country continues to grow, it must face the problems of expansion, such as the now ominous shortages of fuel and energy. There are ways you can help conserve these vital resources. Reduce thermostat settings by two or three degrees. Shut off lights and heat in rooms not in use. And reduce the consumption of electricity in late afternoon or evening. Remember, in conserving fuel and energy, you help yourself and your community. This, land was made for you and me. this public service message is presented by the President's Office of Emergency Preparedness and the Office of Consumer Affairs. Tomorrow at this time, rest your eyes and listen here to this week's continuing study in suspense, The Wife of the Red-Haired Man. I'm Rod Serling. Today's episode brought to you in part by Quaker State and Presto. This is the Zero Hour on Mutual Radio. You have been listening to The Zero Hour, a presentation of the Mutual Broadcasting System in association with Hollywood Radio Theater, heard every weekday at this time. Rod Serling is your host. Zero Hour is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis. The Hollywood Radio Theater theme was played by Ferranti and Teicher and is now available on United Artists Records and Tapes. Hugh Douglas speaking. Tune in tomorrow and once again... Rest your eyes and listen here. To the Zero Hour. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Pick him up. I'm Rod Serling. You're listening to The Zero Hour. 
Rest your eyes. Exercise your imagination. This week, Bill S. Ballinger's best-selling novel, The Pursuit of a Damned Couple. The Wife of the Red-Haired Man. Starring Patty Dugaston. John Aston. And Howard Duff. Elliot Lewis's production of The Zero Hour. The Mutual Broadcasting System presents The Zero Hour. Sponsored in part by the makers of Quaker State Motor Oil and National Presto Industries. This is The Zero Hour on Mutual Radio. Mercedes Turner, scores of homicide, interviewed people who knew the woman, and from their descriptions, produced a police artist drawing of her. By nightfall, this picture would be circulated to airlines, bus depots, train stations, shipping agents, everywhere where Mercedes Turner might be seen. Meanwhile, I began to check into the missing woman's background, searching for some clue to her whereabouts. Mercedes Turner's maiden name was Clinton. Her home had been in Mountain Forge, Connecticut. I drove up there. The police station was across the street from the railroad depot. I parked and went inside. It's not a state officer. I need cooperation from the local police. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm uh, looking for Chief Novak. Speaking to him. You the officer called me from New York? Williams, that's right. Long to take you. Less than three hours. Too close. We folks here feel about city cops. <laughs> well, I just realized I was in a popularity contest. Uh, Mercedes Turner, you said on the phone. Yeah. You know her? Yeah. And she was a little girl. Name was Clinton before she was married. What was she like? Nice kid. Real pretty, lively. Blonde hair, big blue eyes. Did you ever get in any trouble around here? Nope. Caution her once in a while against speeding a mite too fast. Lyman Clinton, her dad, gave her a little yellow car when she first went away to school. Drove it all over. Real fast sometimes. Now, you know kids. Yeah, the Clintons are pretty well off. Uh, don't worry where the next meal's coming from. Old family in these parts? Tolerable. Four or five generations. Was uh, Mercedes an only child? Yeah. Light of Lyman's eye. Mighty proud of her. Maybe a mite too proud. How's that? I sort of always figured he knew what was best. Nothing good enough for her, in Lyman's view. Regardless what she wanted. You believe she uh, shot her own husband? I don't know. What's your opinion? If she wanted too bad enough, she might have. Except one thing don't line up. What I know about Mercedes. What's that? Well, she was brung up proper. Knows right and wrong. And maybe she got mad on blazes. Even had good enough reason to shoot her husband. But if she did it, she'd take a medicine. She'd walk in and hand you the gun. Well, you'll see. you see what I mean when you meet a daddy. We left Hugh's terrible little room hand in hand, like young lovers off on an adventure. I knew we had to get out of the city, and so did Hugh. We took a bus across the river to Jersey City and got off on a bleak street lined with Hugh's car lots, garages, auto parts stores, crawling and sprawling beside one another. We bought an afternoon newspaper, ducked into a shabby little diner, and ordered coffee. Here it is, see? They found it. Yes. But they don't know about you. They're looking for a woman alone. They're looking for me. 
Mercy, after I left last night... I took you... every picture of myself I could find and Albert's gun and threw them away. Ah, that's good. Now, got to get away from here. Where should we go? Anywhere. It doesn't matter. Just leave before they find out about me. Yes. I thought we'd buy a car. That's, that's good. That's good. The police will expect you to take a plane or a bus or whatever. All right. Wait for me. I'll get a car. Be careful. Be very careful. I'm going to get you. Chief Novak and I had lunch, and then I called New York and talked to scores. You got any all points bulletin out on Mercedes Turner with her description, and was in the tedious business of checking out everywhere she might have gone. Friends, neighbors, stores, everything. So far, he'd come up empty. The woman had simply disappeared. I was approaching the puzzle from the other direction, trying to find a connecting thread from her earlier days. Chief Novak drove me out to her father's house, a big old farmhouse set back from the road by a twisting gravel drive. Huge trees towered over the house like great leafy umbrellas. Come in. Lyman Clinton, the woman's father, was tall and thin, a bit stooped. He had a long, thin face with creases running from cheek to nose, snow-white hair. He led Novak and me into a study off the big living room. He motioned us to a couple of worn, shiny leather chairs and seated himself behind an old-fashioned roll-top desk. It was a genteel, patrician background for a woman I was beginning to suspect of murder. Chief Novak says you want to talk about my daughter. That's right, Mr. Clinton. Now, before we get started, if I did know anything, I doubt I'd tell you. Furthermore, I'll never believe she shot Albert Turner. Does she have any reason to shoot him? None I know about. Anyone else want to shoot him? No. You hesitate. Just thinking. Would uh, Mrs. Clinton have any information? Quite sure she wouldn't. Miss Clinton's uh, gone now. Very better than five years. I'm sorry, I didn't realize. Uh, when was the last time you saw your daughter? A couple of weeks ago. Dinner one night in the city. You see her often? My daughter and I are very close. Sometimes she comes up here or else I... I go to New York. When did she marry Albert Turner? A little over a year ago. Do you have a picture of her? No. Not even a wedding picture? You heard me. I don't like pictures. Well, there's one over there. Mrs. Clinton? Yes. That's the exception. And if you had a picture of Mercedes, you wouldn't give it to me anyway, would you? Uh, Williams, I think maybe we uh, better move along. Mm -hmm. All right. <laughs> Thanks for your time, Mr. Clinton. It was while I was buying the car that the questions began gnawing at me. Questions about he. When the war in Vietnam began, he was in one of the first to be drafted. He shipped out very soon after his induction and then... Nothing. No word. No trace. Nothing. The Red Cross helped me, but all we could learn was that he was missing. Missing in action, they said. And then, as years went by, presumed dead. But I waited. And I felt myself drying up. Aging without him. Is this a car? Not bad. This is it. What name did you use? Mrs. Walter Brewer. Trenton, New Jersey. Slide over. I'll drive. Do you have a license? You've been away a long time. Yours isn't good now either. Has your right name on it. What's the difference? If we're stopped, that's it for both of us. Yes. Nice to be driving. <laughs> I didn't think it would happen. Going? Away. Far, far away. You and me, Mercy. Just the way it used to be. Yes. Just the way. After we left.
except Mercedes Turner's father, Chief Novak, and someone else he thought I should see. A woman, Clara Goldwater, who had been close to Mercedes in high school. Clara was married now, wife of a foundry worker in Mountain Forge. I'll wait here. Their home was a squatting, shapeless bungalow in a shabby, genteel sort of neighborhood. You've seen a million places like it. Mrs. Battles? Yes? You used to be Clara Goldwater, a friend of Mercedes Clinton? Oh, yes. My name is Williams, New York Police. Chief Novak is out in my car. May I come in? Oh, yes, come on. She's cranky. Sit down, please. Thank you. What do you want? A little information about Mercedes Clinton Turner. What happened for? She's disappeared. Just gone? Something like that. Oh, my goodness. I know you're busy. This won't take long. When did you last see Mercedes? Oh, not in ages. Years. In high school. Then we sort of drifted apart. But you remember her well. Oh, yes. Such a beauty. Mm. <laughs> Never say that about me. I was the plain one. But we were real close friends, at least for a while. And then she went her way and I went mine. Settled down here. Uh, you ever meet her husband? Robert Turner. Well, does Bill Forsyth in Continue Unloading with Wally Mayer as Joe Giovanni. Superstition on the air. Gentlemen, it is our pleasure to offer you another short, short story in the series designed to disclose the origins of superstition. This one deals with the belief that Friday the 13th is an unlucky day. Henry, aren't you ready yet? Your breath will get cold. Hurry now. I'll be with you in a minute, Doris. Oh, every time you have a day off, Henry, it takes hours before I can get the housework started. And it oh, darling, I'm sorry. But you know I only have a day off once every two weeks. Well, do I get those nice hot biscuits for breakfast? Yes, dear. Here, read the morning paper while I get them out of the oven. All right, honey, but make it snappy. I've got to meet Bill out at the club for a game of golf. Here are the biscuits and your ham and eggs. Now eat them before they get... Great to... Scott! Can you beat that? What's the matter, Henry? Do you know what day this is? No. It's Friday the 13th. Well, what's wrong with that, dear? What's wrong? Why, it's unlucky. Well, now I bet everything will go haywire today. I know I'll have some bad luck. Oh, why, darling, just because it's Friday the 13th, it's no different from any other day. Oh, yes, it is. I look at the disasters that happened on that day in England, right here in our own country. But, darling, those things would have taken place anyway, regardless of the day. Just as the incident that was responsible for starting that belief would have occurred whether it had been Friday the 13th or not. So don't be superstitious. Superstitious? Why, Doris, you know I'm not superstitious. 
But I'll bet Friday the 13th has been a jinx to mankind since the creation of the world. Oh, no, Henry. You're wrong. That superstition began much later than that. It was after the passion and crucifixion of the Christ that the superstition of that day and number became universally feared as an omen of evil. You mean they didn't regard Friday the 13th as unlucky before that time? No. Oh, true, the belief of lucky and unlucky days and numbers had begun with the old Chaldeans and Egyptians. But the actual superstition of Friday the 13th did not begin until after the crucifixion. For people believe that because 13 sat down to the Last Supper, Jesus Christ was betrayed and crucified the following day, which was Friday the 13th of Nisan by the Jewish calendar. Which only proves that Friday the 13th was unlucky, Doris. No, Henry. But don't you remember in the Bible that before the feast of the Passover, Judas had gone into the city of Jerusalem and had bargained with the priests who hated the Christ because he was hailed by the people as a prophet? And they agreed to pay Judas 30 pieces of silver if he would deliver the Christ to them when he was away from the multitude. After the Last Supper, Judas left Jesus and his disciples and went to the temple where the priests were excitedly discussing the growing power of the Christ. Silence, my brethren, silence. We must do away with this man, Jesus of Nazareth, for each day his power grows and he gains more followers. Yea, Caiaphas, only the other day the people did hail him as the son of David. His blasphemy. His sacrilege. He is an imposter. Let us take him. Nay, we cannot seize him while he's amongst the people who love him and call him master. But Caiaphas, what of this Judas Iscariot to whom we paid 30 pieces of silver? He promised to deliver this Jesus of Nazareth unto us. Yea, Joshua, but we must have patience. For I did caution him to wait until the time that his master would be alone so as not to cause a tumult among the people. Aphus, Aphus, Judas Iscariot is here. He would speak with thee. Bring him before me at once. Now, my brethren, perhaps this Judas brings the news we are waiting for. Greetings, Judas Iscariot. Hath thou brought good tidings unto us? Yea, Caiaphas. Tonight as we sat at supper, I learned that the master doth go into the garden of Gethsemane this night to pray there, alone. Now is the time to take him. At last! But, Judas, how will the soldiers know thy master? I will go with them and greet the master with a kiss. By that sign they will know him. Tis well spoken, Judas. Verily, thou art the true savior of Israel. Now thou must go with the soldiers to seize this Jesus of Nazareth before he suspects that something may be amiss by thy absence and elude us. Nay, Caiaphas, the master doth know I will betray him. What? Meanest thou hast allowed him to suspect thee? Nay, but at supper tonight... He did prophesy that one of his disciples would betray him. And when we all asked who it was, he said softly unto me, What thou doest, do quickly. And did the others know it was thou who would betray him, Judas? Nay, for he whispered unto me. And when I left, the disciples thought that I did go on an errand for the master. Oh, then we must act quickly, for verily this man is empowered by the prince of darkness. Elias, take Judas to the soldiers. Now, so that they may go at once to seize his master. Yea, Caiaphas, come with me, Judas. But Caiaphas, dost thou not fear that the people will cause a tumult when they learn that their master hath been taken? We must prevent that, Judas. 